My name is Rick Edgman, and as you know, I'm your instructor for Management 602, Production and Operations Management. So we've just gone through a little bit of background in the area of quality. In particular, we've looked at quality tools and techniques, including the Plan, Do, Study, Act Cycle, Pareto Diagrams, um, some other things such as SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. We've looked at a few things, cause and effect diagrams or fishbone diagrams, as they're also called. We've looked at control charts, at least a few control charts, the P chart and the, and the C chart. What we're going to look at today will be some of the thought development in the history of quality. And in particular, we'll look at some of the people who led the way. Now, it's not that Isaac Newton was a person in quality management or quality improvement, obviously. He was a physicist, mathematician, astronomer, and so on. And he does have a relevant quote, however, and he said that if I have seen a little farther than others, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. And the relevant point here and now is who are some of those giants relative to quality management? So there are many, and they are from around the world, and they are certainly uh, ones who have been around throughout time. Probably the real originator in terms of anything that's regarded as modern quality would be a man named Walter Schuhart. You've seen some of his work. He is the original developer of some of the first control charts that were out there. He also is the person who developed the plan, do, study, act cycle. So he was, in particular, the mentor of the guru of all gurus. He became the mentor of a man named W. Edwards Deming. And that's who we will spend most of the day on, or most of the, the presentation anyway on, is W. Edwards Deming. So remember, you've just seen this, control charts. And he was certainly responsible for control charts, that is, Walter Schuhart. If you want to see a little bit more about some of the tools that we use in Quali, but in a very short video, then I would recommend that you watch this video. It is uh, seven tools, seven quality tools in eight minutes, available through the Gemba Academy. If the link happens to be dead for some reason, then it's easily found on YouTube. <coughs> Excuse me, W. Edwards Deming. So Deming was born in October 1900. He was born in Iowa. As a young boy, his parents moved from Iowa to Wyoming, near, uh, near Cheyenne, near Laramie, near that area. He attended the University of Wyoming, where he earned the undergraduate degree. He earned a master's degree from the University of Colorado. He earned a PhD in physics from Yale University. Now, we regard him as really one of the first statisticians in some sense, because when he went through school, there, were very, there weren't statistics programs. The first statistics programs in the U.S. were at University of Iowa, Iowa State University, University of Wyoming, back in the 1940s, early 1940s. Those are the original departments in the U.S. Well, he was long past his school days, but nevertheless, much of the work that he did is statistical work. It's part of what he's famous for. Statistics or certain statistical techniques are actually very um, often used in physics, and given that he earned the PhD in physics, it's not um, unusual that he picked up a statistical background. At one time, he was the lead statistician for the United States Department of Agriculture. Later, he became the, the lead statistician for the United States Depart uh, Bureau of the Census. In fact, many of the census survey techniques that are used still today are ones that he developed in the 1940s and 1950s. But where he really made his biggest mark was in the area of quality management. So during World War II, he and a few other people helped put many thousands of American workers, mostly women, through training in quality tools. Now, why mostly women? Mostly women because so many of the men were involved in the war effort um, in terms of being in the military. But many of the women who were taught the techniques were women who were involved also in the war effort, but on the manufacturing side of things here in the United States. So women received a lot of training in quality tools and techniques, and part of the popular thinking 
is that really the difference in what we did in quality in the U.S. versus what occurred um, on, on the Axis power side, that is Germany, Japan, uh, Italy, Spain, those powers, we far outstripped them or outpaced them in terms of quality efforts. And so quality tools and techniques are often given a lot of credit for the allied uh, side of the ledger, the U.S., Britain, and some allies, Canada, for example, and others in winning World War II. And it was because of that training. Now, think about it, because at about that time, just before World War II, America owned 70 percent, about 70 percent, 72 percent, I believe, of the world export market share. World War II came around. Things were, or excuse me, 29 percent of the world export market share, 29 percent. What happened? Well, World War II came around. World War II devastated the infrastructure, the buildings, the roads, the communications abilities, and so on. Uh, many of the industrialized nations of the world, especially those in Europe, but also Japan, for example. China was not particularly developed at that time. So what happened? After World War II, America was l left largely intact physically intact from World War II. That is, we did not have buildings blown up. It would be fallacy, by the way, to think that we never were bombed on the mainland. We were, sort of. So, for example, we know that Japanese balloons with small explosives made it as far as the eastern slope of the Rockies in Colorado, near Greeley, near Fort Collins, near Denver, Colorado. So we know that. But generally speaking, we were untouched. My grandfather actually ran a prisoner of war camp for German prisoners of war in Colorado during World War II. So, you know, it wasn't that America was completely untouched, but relative to most of the world, America was untouched. And so the share of the American export market rose from about 29% immediately prior to World War II to about 72%. As of about 1990, it was back down to 29%. We gradually gave up that advantage. And in fact, now I think it's about 11, 12, 13% of the world export market. So our share of the world export market, our being America's share of the world export market has diminished substantially from where it once stood. Now, nobody really expected that 72% to hold as the world recovered from the ravages of war. Uh, Japan, for example, Japan had pre-war, pre-World War II, they had advanced capabilities. What Japan doesn't have is they don't have a lot of natural resources. They are about 80% mountainous. They have 126 million people now that are crowded into land area that's about 80% the size of California. 126 million people, more than a third the population of the U.S., crowded into an area less than the size of California. So they didn't have a lot of natural resources, but they had people who were willing to learn. How does that relate back to Deming? The way that it relates back to Deming is that after World War II, General Douglas MacArthur, who had been the general in charge of American forces in the Pacific Theater, asked Deming to come to Japan to conduct a census. Deming, being the person that he was, did exactly what he was called to do. He led the census uh, effort in Japan. But beyond that, he worked with Japanese scientists and engineers to try to help their nation recover from the ravages of World War II. And he told them that if you will listen to my teachings and follow them, that within five years we will take Made in Japan, which when I was a boy meant junk, we will take that from meaning junk to representing the highest standards of quality within five years. Later in his life, he said it didn't take five years, it took about four years to reverse the quality of what they made to something that was really truly outstanding from something that had been not particularly good at all. Now, America didn't take notice of that until the 1970s, 
we took notice of that when much of the world uh, automobile market was being captured by Japanese automobile manufacturers, Toyota, Datsun, others. Okay. We noticed it then, but also in consumer electronics, where Japanese manufacturers were also starting to make tremendous inroads and capture consumer electronics markets. So in about 1990, NBC, and when, when I was a kid, we didn't have 7 million channels to choose entertainment from on television. We had three, NBC, CBS, and ABC. And depending on where you lived, you might also have had the public broadcasting system, PBS. We had three. So NBC uh, put together what was called a white paper. And it was called, if Japan can, why can't we? If Japan can make all these advances in quality, what's our problem? How come we're losing ground in consumer electronics and in automobile manufacturing? How come our quality is not as good as, it, as the Japanese quality? And in the process of making that, they um, kept hearing this name, Deming, Deming, Deming. And they heard it in association with what happened in Japan in the aftermath of World War II and Deming's involvement there. So Deming, uh, they presumed he was probably dead, given all the time that had elapsed. But then they found that, in fact, he was alive. He was an active consultant. This is, again, around 1990, so he was 90 years old. But what, what they thought, or excuse me, 1980, if Japan can, why can't we? What they thought initially in listening to him when they met with him is that, oh, well, this guy's just senile. But the more they listened to him, the more it made sense. And the more it made sense, you actually had people who decided to leave NBC and become devotees of Deming and his teachings for the rest of their professional lives. Claire Crawford Mason, who's still alive, Lloyd Dobbins, who I believe is still alive, some others. So Deming made a large impression. He did that initially through his teachings that were more statistically oriented in quality. He did it later on in terms of the management philosophy that he developed. So what we're really interested in relative to this particular presentation is we are interested in the Deming management philosophy, which can be construed as a quality management philosophy. So as Deming said, this is just one of the uh, comments that he made to successfully respond to the myriad of changes that shake the world, transformation into a new style of management is required. For him, that was quality management. So he said the route to take is what I call profound knowledge, knowledge for leadership of transformation. <coughs> so his management philosophy, which is often summarized in 14 points for management, seven deadly diseases or sins, and 13 obstacles, which he regarded as not as serious as the seven deadly sins, are actually built on these, this so-called system of profound knowledge that Deming developed. And then those points were summarizations or uh, extractions from that system of profound knowledge. I might also note that, that Deming is famous for Plan, Do, Study, Act as well. Now, it was his mentor, Schuhart, that developed that. But it was really Deming who made obvious the power of Plan, Do, Study, Act and uh, its role in continuous improvement. So much so, the Plan, Do, Study, Act is probably still the dominant uh, philosophy and approach to continuous improvement in Japan and in many of the companies in, around the world who follow what's called lean management practices or lean manufacturing. So Deming was highly involved in that. So involved that it's not usually attributed to Schuhart. It is instead attributed to Deming. He himself always gave credit to Schuhart, but it's sometimes called the Deming cycle or the Deming wheel. So let's take a look at his system of profound knowledge, and then later we'll look at the 14 points for management and so on that were extracted from that. So he had this four-component system of profound knowledge. And those four components were appreciation for a system, 
that's one of the reasons that early on in the course you should have watched that video uh, from Russell Acoff on systems thinking. You might recall that from the, the very beginning of the course. And I would go back and rewatch that now if I were you, appreciation of a system. He then talked about how important understanding variation is to quality improvement. That's the statistical component to his system of profound knowledge. Then he talked about theory of knowledge itself. That's often called epistemology. And lastly, he talked about knowledge of psychology, but for Deming, most of the knowledge of psychology was related to motivation theory. So on, in terms of pr appreciation of a system, and I'll hit just some of the highlights here. <coughs> the idea is that managing a system is action that's based on rational prediction. That is, if there's a system, that system behaves in a particular manner. Once we understand the way that the system behaves, we can start to predict its behaviors, its outcomes. And then we can manage by virtue of no knowing those things. So what does rational prediction mean? It means that we have to develop that understanding of the system. right? So we have to learn and compare predictions of short-term and long-term results from uh, possible alternative courses of action so that we can then choose the best course of action. So what is a system? I'll let you read the subpoints, but essentially a system is a series of functions or activities, sometimes called subprocesses, or stages or components within an organization that work together to try and advance the aim of the organization. Now, from Deming's perspective, every organization should have the same, excuse me, the same aim. And that aim was to create jobs, jobs, and more jobs. That's a direct quote. Create jobs, jobs, and more jobs. What is it that we want to do, obviously enough? Well, we don't just want to manage the system. Ideally, what we'd like to do is optimize the system, make sure that it attains its very best performance. And anything short of that causes some form of loss. Anything less than ideal means that you're performing suboptimally. If you're performing suboptimally, you're not doing all that you can in producing the best results that, that are possible. Therefore, any discrepancy between the best possible and whatever is actually delivered can be thought of as a loss. And there were a lot of ways that he felt like we could suboptimize or make the system underperform. And one of those areas was just in the general management of people itself. And there are losses that we see and we recognize as losses. There are other things that we just can't even know. So he viewed the merit system as a destroyer of intrinsic motivation with emphasis on rank, not on work. He felt like what you should really emphasize is the quality of the work and the nature of the work that's being performed, not necessarily the rank of the person inside the organization. He used grading in school as an example of sub-optimization. Deming himself, while he was predominantly a consultant and had worked for the Census Bureau and the Department of Agriculture and so on, he also taught until almost the time of his death in 1993 in the Stern School of Business at New York University. He never assigned anything other than an A for a grade in the courses that he taught. And he said he was only ever disappointed one time by one student. And part of his perspective was you give people standards to work toward. And he felt like people given a high standard will work to meet or exceed that standard. He viewed management by, by objectives as a negative. That is, we want to obtain this objective. Well, that sounds great if the objectives are the right objectives. Or management by imposition of results. Incentive pay. He viewed incentive pay as a negative. Why? because it implies that people are not working or giving their best in the first place. So therefore, oh, you have to pay them extra, or you have to give them some additional, quote-unquote, incentive, because otherwise people are just not inclined to give you their best effort. <coughs> and he felt that that mindset was a very negative in, uh, mindset 
that in fact cause suboptimal performance. So the lack of coordinated business plans. So you have a large company, it has multiple divisions, they each have their own business plan, but they don't necessarily coordinate well. Well, that suboptimizes the entire organization. Work standards for production and quotas for sales, quotas for accidents and breakdowns. That is, it's okay if we average two accidents per month or two lost employee days, work days per month or per week or per whatever unit of measure due to injury suffered on the job, then that's acceptable. Well, no. Having a quota for something that's unacceptable in the first place, a standard for something that's unacceptable in the first place, that doesn't make sense. So we don't have quotas for negative things. We don't have some limit that we say, it's okay as long as we stay under there. Competition for market share, barriers to trade, such as embargoes or such as tariffs, he felt were uh, negative because things like tariffs inherently interfere with competition. They interfere with the free market economy. And if you're not competing in a free market economy, then you're using other things as um, aids or excuses for your less than optimal performance. He also talked about as a second component, <coughs> not just knowledge of systems, but th the theory of variation. So now what we're talking about literally is unwanted variation in our outcomes, not intentional variety that we've introduced. Intentional variety is fine. But we're talking about everything that we're producing here should be one half inch long. But it isn't. It should be one half inch long, but it isn't. Okay. So anything that isn't that half inch, you're talking about variation in your system. And so he wants you to understand statistically variation. He wants you to know about the variance, about the standard deviation, how those relate to the mean how outcomes tend to pile up in, say, a normal or any other distribution. He wants you to be able to do those things because that enables you to formulate strategy in an uncertain world. Variation represents how much uncertainty we have. We will almost always have some level of uncertainty. The trick is to be able to navigate that uncertainty level effectively. So he talked about various things that were elements of a statistical theory of variation. And you can read this slide just as easily as I can, but we have just come through a tool that helps us um, characterize and formulate strategies for action around variation. We did that by using a tool like the control chart. Control charts are very adept at helping you maneuver and manage in the face of variation or in the face of inconsistent outcomes. And there are some other things that you can look at. Here you might look at this particular slide that talks about the distinction between what Deming called enumerative studies and analytical problems. So you might want to take a look at that. That's just to get down some of the Deming vocabulary. And finally, he said, knowledge about the losses that come from unfortunate successive application of random forces and random changes that may be individually unimportant. And he's giving an example that I'm familiar with on a personal level. <coughs> and it says, working, training, worker, training, worker, training, worker, training, worker, and so on. So person A trains person B, person B trains person C, C each trains D, and so on. And so what you have is anything that was wrong in what A was doing is being passed on from A to B and to C and to D and, and, and. Anything that B was doing wrong added to that something else wrong is now also being passed on from B to C, B to D, B to, indirectly B to D, but passed on. Anything additional that C is doing wrong 
now gets passed on to D, E, F, and so on. And so that's the idea about compounding errors. Workers training workers, training workers, and so on. Uh, executives working with best efforts on policy, but without guidance of profound knowledge. In other words, they're almost doing it on their gut, their gut feel. And they may have very good, very profound gut feels about things. But at the same time, they are not using data-driven decision making. So what Deming is expressing here when he says executives working with best, practice, best efforts, best efforts, not necessarily best results, not necessarily best strategies, but with, they're putting in their full effort for policies, but without guidance of profound knowledge, he's saying they're not using data-driven decision making. <coughs> Other examples? Bigger, sorry, bigger is not always better. Enlargement of a committee doesn't necessarily improve the, the function of the results of that committee's work. So as a rule, profound knowledge has to come from the outside, and usually by invitation. It does, doesn't necessarily come all by itself, by invitation. So theory of knowledge, so so-called epistemology, we've talked about knowledge of systems, knowledge of variation, theory of knowledge. And he says that any rational plan, no matter how simple it is, requires prediction concerning conditions, uh, behavior, comparison of performance of each of two procedures or materials. So you are always trying to make a plan, meaning a from among alternative courses of action, choosing which course you will follow. As it, as it states in the second bullet, a statement that is devoid of prediction or explanation of past events is no help in management of a system. That is, past behavior often informs both present and future behavior. And he says that if you're not using that information, then you're not doing as well as you can. He said if you don't have a theory, there's nothing to modify and learn by comparison with experience. Experience is a, a great teacher. You've heard that saying a lot. We need to learn from experience. We're not running into every situation as a new situation. Every event is a new thing. No, sometimes we can learn from the past how it is we should be behaving now and in the future based on what's happened in the past. So let's see if we can identify a few other things. Uh, notice that he says the second bullet, communication and negotiation requires operational definitions to achieve optimization. Now we'd talked about this sort of thing just in passing when we talked about control charts. So if I were going to look, let's say, at this cup and say, let's count the number of defects on this cup, then what I'd have to do is I would have to have operational definitions as to what constitute uh, flaws in that cup, shortcomings in the cup. Okay, I don't want something where one person says that's a flaw, but not another person. I need a uniform standard that can be applied so that we can move forward in one direction with the same understanding. It doesn't mean that we don't develop future understanding, but it does mean that we need common ground to work from. So communication is important, and having a standard is part of that communication. No number of examples establish a theory. It doesn't matter how many examples you have, Examples you can think of as, that's a good story. Right? That's a good story. But it's just a story. Okay, It may illustrate a great point, but it's still just a story. So no number of examples establishes, that is, uh, makes some theory true. But a single unexplained failure of a theory means that that theory doesn't hold universally and it needs to be modified. Okay, that is part of the process of learning. 
as it says here, there is no true value of any characteristic state or condition that is defined in terms of measurement of observation. In other words, we can never measure perfectly. And even if we could measure perfectly, we usually wouldn't. Our measurement devices are not such that they measure without error. So, if you change a procedure for measurement or observation, that produces some new number. So I can, I can say the diameter of the top of this cup is 4 inches. But if I use a different instrument to measure that, two different instruments, I'm probably going to get two different measurements. Okay, two different types of instruments, two different uh, values for the measurement. Two different techniques for measuring. Not tools, but techniques. Two different approaches for measuring. Might produce two, two different measurements. We don't know which is right and which is wrong. And in fact, they're probably, what he's saying here is, they're both wrong. The question is not, are they right or are they wrong? The question is, how close to being correct are they? And that's where variation also happens to be married to knowledge. And then finally, his fourth area in the system of profound knowledge was psychology, which again, in, in the Deming frame, is mostly talking about human motivation. So what are you trying to understand? The uh, people and the interactions between people and the circumstances in which they, uh, they exist. People are different from one another. We know that. If you talk to me and ask me a question right now, how do I feel? and you ask me again an hour from now, you're probably going to get a different answer. I mean, we vary throughout the day. We vary over very short periods of time. So if we, as a single individual, are not 100% consistent, then why in the world would we expect that people are not different from one another? So leaders, though, have to be able to be aware of and negotiate um, those differences negotiate the varying paths that those differences imply. Why? Because we have to optimize organizational performance. We have to optimize organizational culture. We have to optimize team performance. And trust me, the best team does not result from each individual giving their best effort. You know, as an example of that, when I first lived in Denmark in 1997-98, one of the lead soccer teams in the world was a team out of Italy. And at that time, so this is 1997 or early 1998, that, that club, that soccer club, basically assembled all of the best players in the world and they signed them to enormous contracts and had them on that particular club, uh, football club as they would call it, soccer team. In fact, the team... Um, the team, what would you call it, payroll during that period was a quarter of a billion dollars for one year. A quarter of a billion dollars for one year. Now, this is almost 25 years ago. That would be a lot more money now. And with the growth in, in uh, interest and revenues that has come in the meantime from sports, from entertainment in general, from uh, market share, from pointing things out or broadcasting things on television, on the internet, and so on. It is not like it's only doubled. It is, it is magnified or multiplied many times. But what they ended up with for that quarter of a billion dollars at that time was a team with a lot of great individual players who, as a team, did not perform well. Now, as the season went on, their performance did improve. But what they had were a lot of terrific players who were not used to sacrificing their personal performance for the good of the team. They were used to being the star on a team. Now there were a bunch of stars, and there wasn't enough, uh, enough fame to spread around, so to speak, enough glory to spread around across that many great players. So they didn't perform well as a team. Every person giving their best effort does not necessarily lead to the best team result. People learn in different ways. 
and at different speeds. Some learn best by reading, some by listening, some by watching pictures or movies, uh, or by moving or by observation. Uh, others learn by doing. So I learn better from what I see. I remember almost everything I see. I forget a lot of things that I hear. So I am a visual learner. I am not an oral learner, A-U-R-A-L. I don't learn so much from what I hear. Um, I am a kinesthetic learner, so good muscle memory. I learn from what I do. But I don't necessarily learn just by sitting and watching uh, somebody do something. So there's that part. What that means is what? That we need to be able to understand how different learning styles complement one another and how in some cases they work against one another. But what we're trying to do is leverage how they complement one another to put together a better team and a better unit performance as opposed to just individual performances. And then as it says, by virtue of the authority that a leader has, they're obligated to make changes in the system of management that bring improvement. <coughs> so again, when Deming talks about the theory of psychology, he's really talking about motivation. And he talks about intrinsic motivation, extrinsic motivation, and over-justification. So intrinsic comes from the inside out. Um, ex extrinsic motivation means that you had to have motivation from some exterior uh, source. So I am not particularly motivated by money. That's me. If you throw a bunch of money at me, it's not going to get me to do a better or worse job, generally speaking. There might be exceptions. Okay, But I am motivated by how I feel inside. I am motivated by whether or not what I've done makes a difference for somebody or for a company or for a community. Those things are more motivating for me. So for me, I am more of an, an intrinsically motivated person than I am an extrinsically motivated person. Okay. And over-justification basically means making excuses for why you do what you do. So we know that people are born with, uh, generally speaking at least, for need with, for relationships with other people. So most people want to be loved, they want to be needed, they want to be respected, all right? Most people, not everybody, but certainly by far, by far the large majority of people. Circumstances themselves sometimes give some people dignity and self-esteem, but they deny others those same advantages. That's why we have so much discussion these days about um, marginalized communities. Okay, It's one of the reasons that we have so much discussions now about inclusion, diversity, inclusion, marginalized communities, is because we are trying to level the playing field in which people operate. We're trying to provide the same opportunities for dignity and self-esteem, or at least not to deny opportunities for dignity and self-esteem. So management that denies dignity and self-esteem, they'll smother intrinsic motivation. They really will. So we want to be aware of those things. <coughs> and then note also that, um, let me find it real quickly. And see where it is. There it is. So that first bullet, when it says extrinsic motivation is submission to external forces that neutralize intrinsic motivation, one of those, one is ruled by the forces. And then it says extrinsic motivation is a quote unquote zero defect mentality. So what that means is you're not giving us your best, but if we can pile enough kudos for you up, if we can give you enough money, if we can pin enough medals on you, if we can give you enough trophies, then you're going to do perfect work for us. Okay, we're going to buy our way into zero defects. That's what that means. Well, you know what? That doesn't work so well. Notice also what Deming said. Removal of a demotivator 
doesn't necessarily create motivation. It just means that the demotivator is gone. What is overjustification? It's a result of faulty reward systems. And it is a resignation to outside forces. So all of these things, Deming's system of profound knowledge, as it was called, knowledge of systems, of variation, of knowledge, and of psychology, are usually summarized in 14 points for management, seven deadly diseases or sins, sometimes called quality cancers, and 13 obstacles. So there is a video for you on this slide. Hopefully the link is active and you would be able to take a look at that. Otherwise you can easily find videos on YouTube where Deming himself would talk about the 14 points for management. And if not Deming himself, then certainly people who are devoted, uh, devoted to Deming's management philosophy and approach. His first one was create constancy of purpose. So his first point for management, create constancy of purpose. Now, I will tell you that we use, uh, you might notice on my shirt that it says Shingo Institute. So prior to coming to Forte State University, I was the research director for, and a uh, professor of management practice in the John M. Huntsman School of Business at Utah State University. The Shingo Institute is the home of what's called the Shingo Prize for Operational Excellence. It is the only true global quality award. It's distinguished from some of the other major quality awards that are out there by virtue of the fact that it focuses more on lean and so on. But one of the values that they have is also constancy of purpose. But I'm going to talk about constancy of purpose in a way that is more aligned with what the Shingo Institute uses than what uh, Deming intended. <coughs> so constancy of purpose doesn't mean that your goal never changes. That really isn't what it means, although that would be easy to imply from the, the term. What constancy of purpose means is that you have a critical mass inside your organization that buy into a common vision and are willing to step forward, step forward with that and act upon that, that vision. So act in terms of mission, in executing the vision. All right, so shared mission, vision, and purpose. Shared mission, vision, and purpose where that can change over time as to what it is. But the point is that you need a critical mass of people that are bought into shared mission, vision, and purpose and are moving forward for the organization. His second point for management was this one, learn and adopt a new philosophy. So the idea here is uh, what is that new philosophy? It's the new quality philosophy. So it is be focused on the quality of what you produce, the value of what you produce and deliver. The quality and the value. And he made a point that cost has no meaning apart from the quality that that cost purchases for you. He also said, and I think this may have been true in his day, but not now. Customers don't complain. They merely switch brands. Uh, not anymore. Not in the age of social media. In the, in the age of social media, everybody wants to have a platform, and a lot of people do. And if they have a complaint, they make sure that they scream it at the top of their Internet lungs, of their social media lungs. So customers do complain and they switch brands. So Deming's point may have been valid uh, 30 years ago, but it's, it's not the way it is now with the rise of social media. He makes the point that in earlier times, any system of management would have worked. What does he mean? Well, especially he was talking about in the US and after World War II, because in earlier times, after World War II, America's infrastructure is largely intact. We've always been uh, rich in terms of our natural resource availability. We had a trained workforce. We had people who wanted to work. Educational 
uh, system good, all of those things. When the rest of the world, or much of the rest of the world, was left devastated from World War II. So we had that huge advantage. That's the reason that we went from having 29% of the world export market to about 72% of the world export market. But again, that declined over time, and now we're at probably 11, 12, 13%. So back in those prior times, any system management would have worked because we could sell anything we made, whether it was good, bad, or anything in between. We could sell anything that we made. But that's not the case anymore. So what does that mean? It means that you have to identify how and where you compete, and one of the areas you can compete is on quality. <coughs> His third point. Cease dependence on mass inspection. So when would you do a lot of inspection of what you make? You would do a lot of inspection of what you make when a lot of what you make is not so good. So what you're trying to do with cease dependence on mass inspection is you're trying to become good enough that you don't need the mass inspection. Right? You have to become good enough first. But once you become good enough, cease dependence on mass inspection. You don't become better by inspecting poor quality things out so that they don't reach the consumer. You become better by building better quality things in the first place. Build quality in, not inspect poor quality out. And that is one of the points that he's trying to make there, or tried to make. So I can, I can tell you this, by the way, with Deming, Deming died on December 21st, 1993. When Deming died, that was front page, full page news, Wall Street Journal, uh, USA Today, and a lot of other outlets around the world. It was big news. It's why in America... Um, National Quality Month is always October because October was the month that he was born in. So, you know, Deming was a big deal. Uh, he's a guy who, as a consultant, and remember, he died almost 30 years ago now. As a consultant, he made as much as $40 million in a day. He also happened to be a guy who, um, you know, many people talk about the concept of tithing and giving 10% of their income for some purpose. Deming gave 90% of his income away. When he died in 1993, he was still driving the same 1969 white Lincoln Continental that he purchased brand new. He didn't see any need to replace that car, and it served his purpose just fine. He was still living in a relatively modest two-story brick house in Bethesda, Maryland. Now, Bethesda is an expensive place. Um, I lived and worked in the, the Washington, D.C. area when I was at the University of Maryland. Bethesda is an expensive place. But the point is that that home was a very modest home. He didn't need more or didn't see the need for more. His personal assistant worked out of an office in, I think, the basement of his home. So, you know, Deming was highly, highly successful, and he was highly revered. He is the man who was given credit for turning around the Japanese economy after World War II. The highest award in Japan is the Deming Prize. Okay? The Deming Prize, which tells you something about how influential he was in what he did. Now, the truth of it is that he wasn't the only one. Uh, Joseph M. Duran was another person who was uh, very active in Japan after World War II, who was also very influential in terms of their, their economic turnaround. So D Deming did not do all that single-handedly, and sometimes he gets too much credit for having done so. He never sought that credit. So Joseph M. Duran was another one of those people. In fact, when Duran died in 2008, he was 104. His wife died very shortly thereafter, she was also 104 when she died. They had been married 80 years. Uh, he measured his success very differently also. Measured his success in terms of the life he lived and the difference he made 
for people by working with organizations. And for Deming, it was very similar. This is probably the most controversial of Deming's points for management because it's often misunderstood. You just have to read it carefully and understand what it is saying versus what it isn't saying. <coughs> so this is on the idea of what contractors will you work with? What suppliers will you work with? And he said, and the practice of awarding your business to suppliers or contractors based on what they're charging you alone. That's why I emphasize the word alone as being underlined. He did not say, don't make price tag a consideration. He did say, don't make that your sole consideration in terms of uh, who it is that you award your contract to. Right? Price tag means nothing independent of the quality you get for what you pay. Improve constantly and forever the system of production and service. What does that mean? It means don't just put a Band-Aid on your wound. We want to be involved in continuous improvement efforts. And anytime we gain ground, we want to make sure that we hold the ground as we move forward. And you can read some of the bullet points yourself. Institute training and retraining. This is uh, what I would call basic training. Okay, basic training. So Deming's idea was that everybody needs to be trained to be able to do their job, but there's some training that everybody should have. Some of the training everybody should have, for example, would be understanding about variation. Okay, so institute training and retraining. Always making sure people have the skills they need to do the job that they were hired to do. Because if you don't provide them with the skills they need, the equipment that they need, and so on, to do the job they were hired to do, fundamentally you're disrespecting them and placing them at a disadvantage. Teach and institute leadership. Now, thoughts on this have changed over the last 30 years. But his point was that he felt that leadership was management's job because leadership is, or management rather, is who have the authority to make decisions. And then he emphasized how important it is for uh, managers to be able to know what the jobs are that the people Engine. who work for them um, are intended to be doing. Drive out fear. Create trust, create a climate for innovation. Okay, you probably know, and maybe you've been in circumstances where if you admit that you don't know how to do something, or admit that you made a mistake, that you render yourself vulnerable. So the idea for Deming here was that you want to root out that inherent vulnerability. You want to make sure that people have the opportunity to learn and create, that there is forgiveness for honest mistakes although the, those mistakes might be balanced with accountability. So there is trust that has to be built, and there has to be forgiveness for honest mistakes, while at the same time building in a level of accountability. Because if people don't feel like they have that, they are more likely to hold back, A, their best efforts, for fear of making mistake with a punitive reaction to that mistake, it's those sorts of considerations. Break down barriers between staff areas. So these are mostly communication barriers, although they could be actual literal physical barriers or something like that, that keep people from communicating or one department from communicating with another. So I usually say <coughs> that communication is the shadow behind everything that goes on in the organization. Perfect communication, if there were such thing, you would greatly enhance the level of your performance. The less perfect your communication, generally the poorer the performance that you experience and produce. Eliminate slogans, exhortations, and targets for the, work uh, for the workforce. Basically, what this says is that uh, words alone aren't going to accomplish anything for you. You might recognize an old advertising slogan for Ford, uh, Ford Motor Company. It was, quality is job one. Okay, well, you can say that, 
But unless you are providing the workforce with everything they need to actually accomplish quality, then they're only words. Right? The point is to create a system that enables people to make those targets legitimate. I mean, when I was at, uh, when I was working my way through college, there was a summer where I worked for Estes Rockets, uh, the model rocket company. Now, that may sound glamorous, but the truth of it is I've never had a more mindless, brain-numbing job in my life. So I worked a 3.30 to midnight shift at a time when the, uh, the minimum wage was $2 an hour. I got $2.05 an hour for working 3.30 to midnight, for which I had to drive 25 miles each direction to get to work. So, you know, it wasn't too enjoyable, but what really made it not so enjoyable wasn't the time, it wasn't the wage. It was the work itself. It was sitting at a machine where I had a quota to produce, let's say, 4,000 parachute lines during my shift. My shift was eight hours, okay, fundamentally a half hour off for, for lunch or dinner. So I had an eight hour shift, I was supposed to produce uh, 4,000 parachute lines. The truth of it is, I could do 4,000 parachute lines in the first half of my shift. So I would work f faster, but at a still safe level uh, without flaws and so on, just so I could do something different after, uh, you know, after I had my dinner. So, I mean, they, lo they love me because I got more done. But the point is that that 4,000, where did that number come from? You know, I could pretty easily do 4,000 in four hours. So where in the world did the standard come from for 4,000 for eight hours? The answer is it was probably set without really knowing what was reasonable and what wasn't. It may have been set uh, based on demand for their products, but the truth of it is they probably had too large a workforce for what their actual need was. On the other hand, they had an incredibly cheap workforce. That was in Penrose, Colorado, which for those of you who know a little bit of Southern Colorado, was, uh, it's between Pueblo, Colorado, where I grew up, a city of about 100,000, and up by the Royal Gorge, about halfway in between Pueblo and the Royal Gorge. Royal Gorge being west of Canyon City, Colorado. Eliminate numerical quotas. That's more or less what I was just talking about. Eliminate numerical quotas. Next. Uh, but what's the alternative to numerical quotas? The answer is a properly, a properly set work standards that defines what is and what is not acceptable in terms of quality. <coughs> and I would say quantity if you are able to numerically validate that that's a reasonable value. Give people a chance to take pride in their work. Pretty much everybody wants to take pride in their work. Give people that chance. This one, this is his 13th point for management. Encourage education of self and self-improvement for everyone. This is more the advanced training sorts of stuff. It's not the baseline training. It is really the growth in your job, the growth in your personal capabilities that enables you to grow in what you deliver and the responsibility that you're able to take on within the organization. And so finally, there's the plan, plan do, study, act cycle. And that was his 14th point. Take action to accomplish the necessary transformation where taking action for Deming meant fundamentally engage routinely in plan, do, study, act applied to the organization. Now, I usually modify that. This modification that you see is more or less based on uh, what I did for Hewlett Packard. So what I would say is it looks a little bit uh, different. There's some, I believe, some text that you're not seeing. But the idea is here, down here, at the very start. <coughs> There's probably some text that turned to white that's sitting down there, but what it would say is this. Establish baseline conditions. That is, before you ever set out on a journey, you need to know where you're setting out from. So before you ever enter that first planning phase for improving the system that you're working with or the process you're working with, 
first be able to describe what its performance is like right now. So again, it's probably sitting down in text that's white hidden hidden there uh, that got changed whenever I change backgrounds on this slide. But establish baseline results, very bottom and center of the slide. Once you've got that, plan a change that you think will be beneficial to the performance of the process. Do the change. And doing the change would then be something like implementing, hopefully on a small scale, since it may not be as effective as it needs to be for you to invest at the level needed to invest to make it better. Study the results of the change. Okay, that is gather data, see whether or not the change you made is effective and effective enough. And you are moving from here to here to do, to study, to standardize. That is before you implement more broadly. Standardize the approach you use so that you're implementing one solution not what you think is one solution but that has 10 different flavors because you didn't take the time to standardize baseline conditions plan do study standardize act <coughs> and then acting would ordinarily mean go ahead and implement on a broader scale assuming that what you did was effective enough and as you continue in this figure eight on its side, figure eight style continuous improvement cycle. Always be sure to hold on to whatever ground you've gained as you proceed. But this is a continuous improvement cycle. The thought being that it's a never ending cycle. Now that may not be true. It may be that you hit technological barriers where you can't improve anymore until that technological barrier is surmounted. Or it may be that you have more important places to invest your resources so as long as you can hold steady you're happy at least for a while so i'll talk about a never-ending cycle of continuous improvement but there are reasons to at least put that cycle on pause for a while and just keep it at status quo and then there will be a video here that you could watch and see what others think so what are we talking about? This is just a description of what we've just talked about. Plan, do, study, standardize, act, hold the game. Those were the four, 14 points for management. Then there are seven deadly diseases, one of which is lack of constancy of purpose. If constancy of purpose having that critical mass of individuals in the organization who have who have a shared vision right so vision mission and purpose to move forward with if having that is the most important point for management the very first one then certainly lack of constancy of purpose would be a deadly disease that would be flitting about not knowing what you're doing another deadly disease emphasis on short-term profits and, and this really is a deadly one it's the one that says you know, because we have shareholders, we want to make what we're doing look the best right now that we can. So we'll focus on quarterly profits, meaning that you may implement a short-term strategy that looks good in the short term, but that really hurts you in the longer run. So short-term planning, not a good idea. Why? Short-term profits is what you're focusing on. The idea that annual evaluations may also not be so good. Management by objectives or annual uh, rating. Why? Because a lot of times, if you're only going through an annual evaluation cycle, then what's happening is that at the end of a year, you're telling people what they did wrong 10 months previously, that they can't even correct now or do anything about. They're just being penalized now for what they did 10 months previously. So Deming's idea, and he didn't have a lot of alternative suggestions, by the way, other than more routine feedback. But the idea was that these things can be incredibly demoralizing. And they can unless they give you opportunities for corrective action and improvement action. And uh, the closer you can come to doing that in real time, the better. Hence, more frequent feedback was his alternative. <coughs> the next two were what he characterized as uniquely American diseases. Excessive medical cost, having lived in a nation for several years with social medicine, Denmark, 
I fully understand uh, Deming's point on excessive medical cost. Excessive cost on warranties that are fueled by what? Lawyers who work based on uh, and get paid based on how much they win in court settlements. America is by far the most litigious nation in the world. We sue more than any other nation in the world, by far. No close competition, no close second. And then he had a couple others for his deadly diseases. One of those was running a company on visible figures alone. And his point was that a lot of the most important figures are the ones that you can't see, don't see, you may never see. And then mobility of top management. That is, rather than having a culture that remains relatively constant and fixed and healthy, instead somebody leaves and we hire somebody else new from the outside. And they bring in uh, their agenda to implement in a short amount of time so that they can make their mark on the company so that they can move on to their next job, next and better job. Okay, that was the thinking behind mobility of top management as opposed to, say, in Japan, where promotion tends to be from within. And many people tend to work from one company for all of their career. And then he had 13 obstacles that he considered generally not as serious as the diseases. So let's just take a look at that. If being able to plan for the long term is important, then surely neglect of long-range planning is a negative. So thinking that new um, new equipment, new approaches, that that's going to solve all your problems. Uh, no, in fact, one of the early winners of America's National Quality Award, the Malcolm Baldrige National Quality Award, went to Japan. Uh, their, their name was uh, Millikan & Company. Millikan & Company produces, for example, carpet. And they thought that when they went to Japan and looked at Japanese company, they were going to find a lot more automation. And that, 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 in fact, was why Japanese companies were so good at what they were doing with carpet. Well, that wasn't true. They found older automation, older equipment. What they found was that people were doing things differently, working differently. People habits, not equipment changes. Next, this is uh, an example that he means it can be taken to the extreme that you have a problem and you're looking for what somebody else did that solved the same problem. So you're just looking to copy somebody else's solution instead of determining precisely what's best for you. And again, this is taking that to the extreme. It doesn't mean don't look for, for good solutions outside of your company. By any means, it doesn't mean that. That process is called benchmarking, looking in other areas for successful solutions. But it means looking for exactly that thing that you can just copy. You don't even have to understand it. Just copy it. That's a problem. And that sort of approach almost took down another one of the early, uh, another one of the early Baldrige Award-winning companies in America, which was the Wallace Corporation, out of Houston, Texas. Obsolete schools of business. What did Deming mean there? He meant that that business schools needed to teach more in the way of quality, but that they weren't, at least not at that time. And in fact, even now, I would say that uh, we're still not there in most business schools. Not in the U.S. anyway. So this one is a comment mostly about consultants. And it's the idea that, well, if somebody's going to help us, they have to understand everything about us. No, sometimes it's that old saying that you can't see the forest for the trees. You're so deeply involved in the business, you can't see anything outside of it. Sometimes it's very healthy to have somebody with an outside perspective come in. Blaming the workforce for problems. So Deming um, early on said that 85% of the problems that were out there were ones that, um, that could only be solved by management and 15% were due to the actual workers. And he kept bumping that as he went throughout his life. Late in his life, he came to a point where he said, 94% of the problems that arise in businesses are problems that only management can solve because they have the authority to solve. And only 6% of the problems are ones that the workers themselves are responsible for and can solve. 
false starts. Being in too much of a hurry and then doing it wrong out of the gate. That can also be very damaging to someone's stock price, let's say. Meeting specifications. Now on the surface, meeting specifications probably sounds good to you. It's the idea that, well, this straw needs to have a diameter for its opening of a quarter inch. So let's always be a quarter inch. Let's be within specifications. In fact, we could be within a quarter inch plus or minus a sixteenth. So anywhere between three and five sixteenths inch. And if we're in there, fantastic. Well, just because you meet specifications doesn't mean you're doing a good job. It may mean that you have the wrong values, but you're still meeting specifications for those wrong values. This is the opposite of that obstacle of searching for examples that can be copied. This is the one that says our mindset is that we are so unique we can't learn from anybody. We just have to figure it all out ourselves. Well, taken to the extreme, that is also a problem. Reliance on quality control departments and organizations. When is that a problem? The idea is that quality is everybody's job. You are responsible for your work and the quality that you deliver. Now, you may not be solely responsible because what you do depends to a large degree on what was passed on to you to do. But nevertheless, it's the idea that, oh, that's not my job. That's somebody else's job. That's the quality control department's job. No, it's everybody's job. Quality by inspection. We talked about that. This is the idea of expecting poor quality out so that the, it doesn't hit the uh, marketplace. But it doesn't make what you're doing better. It doesn't make what you're doing better. It just means that your, uh, your marketplace isn't seeing what you did wrong, maybe. And then the unmanned computer. You know, we have no shortage of data. We really do not have any shortage of data. What we do have is a lot of data that's running around that we didn't even know what we might use it for when we were getting it, and we still don't use it, the unmanned computer. And lastly, rushing things to market, inadequate testing of prototypes. So Deming said, export anything to a friendly country except American management. So he obviously did not have a very high opinion of our management style. Our people, that's one thing. Our management approaches, that's another thing. And then there are usually a few other names. You can learn more about these people. Uh, Joseph M. Duran, who we talked about. Phil Crosby, who we have not talked about. And Armand V. Feigenbaum, Val. Val Feigenbaum was a friend of mine. He died a handful of years ago. But he was one of the really early movers in the area of quality, and he wrote the first book on total quality control, 1957, I believe, was his landmark book on total quality control. But he was a CEO. Crosby was a consultant. He was more of a rah-rah type. He's famous for the phrase, quality is free. Uh, the idea for Crosby really wasn't that quality was free, but, but that well done, quality would pay for itself. So there was Duran, we talked about Duran, the influence that he also had in Japan. And there is a significant amount on Duran's uh, theory here. We talked about Pareto diagrams or Pareto charts a few lectures ago. Duran is the one who was able to take that idea, which originated with the study of the distribution of wealth in nations, and to generalize it more broadly into what's called the 80-20 rule that 80% of the problems are due to only 20% of the causes. And we've talked about this particular tool, the Pareto Principle or Pareto uh, Chart. Feigenbaum, again, total quality control. And then Crosby, zero defects. So those are some of the, the gurus that are out there. There's more about each of Crosby and Feigenbaum and Duran that you can find in hidden slides that I have in this particular slide set. And that is what we've got for now on quality, history, and leaders. So thanks a lot. The next topic that we will move into will end up being in, uh, in the area of lean enterprise, lean manufacturing.